so uh, this is a TED style talk. <laughs> and I laugh when they say that because uh, I find that intimidating. And I think it was Phil in the hall who said, oh yeah, you're doing a TED style talk. That means no podium. I thought, oh yeah, okay, no podium. And then he said, and, that, and it's short. I thought, yeah, okay. It's gonna be short. And then he said, um, and really interesting, amazing. I thought, oh. <laughs> uh, so uh, to, there is no podium and it's short, although none of this time right now counts in my 15 minutes. <laughs> so to make it really interesting and amazing, I'm gonna do what I do for a long time, which is wear my broken glasses because I can't see anything and I haven't gotten them fixed. For those of you who have seen me do this before, it's been a long time actually. Um, so I apologize. So the amazing interesting part is, um, are they gonna fall off her face while she's doing that talk? Are they gonna go like this? Like what's gonna happen with the glasses? Um, okay, so I am super happy to be here to talk about uh, using brain science to build a new two gen intervention. And um, uh, I am no brain scientist. <laughs> I'll just start there. So, so what we're doing is using other people's science to think about intervention. And uh, we have done our work building on the work we were doing already, which is to think about uh, social, emotional, and behavioral development in children, primarily in school settings. And we began to think, wow, um, we're not really doing exactly what we need to do because we haven't thought carefully about the adults. And so we started this project to build a new two-gen intervention. And in our view, our two-gen intervention goes beyond what I would describe as perhaps more traditional approaches to those interventions. And if you've heard Jack talk about this, uh, you will recognize what I'm about to say, which is that this kind of intervention that, that we're doing um, moves beyond the kind of intervention that has been called 2Gen in the past, which is about providing parents with information under the assumption that parents, that we should be telling parents to do something differently and that the way to have that happen, if that's even appropriate, uh, is to just give them information about how to do it or to just simply attempt to engage parents in children's schooling. Another sort of, I would say, more traditional approach is to think about two-gen interventions by co-locating services. So uh, locating in one setting services for children like child care, uh, along with job training or education for adults. And that's also not what we're doing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, it's just not what we're doing. The way we are thinking about it is a linking science to intervention to gen intervention, which is about thinking about how you can provide supports for adults and children that are along a common theme and do it in ways that resonate with what adults and children are facing in those particular settings. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. And it's all grounded in the field of social, emotional, and behavioral development for children and adults. And so what we've learned from that field is three big things. First thing is that uh, social, emotional, and behavioral development of children and adults is basically and fundamentally rooted in a system of executive functions and related regulated behaviors, so self-regulation. And those two systems, which are at the root of social, emotional development, are highly subject to stress. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we've learned from doing this work is that aligning experiences across settings is likely to generate bigger impacts than just focusing in one place or with one target. The second thing, the third thing is that we really can't make the difference we want with kids if we don't think very carefully about the adults, so teachers and parents. And so this body of work has guided uh, our focus, the focus of what I'm going to talk about today, which is largely with parents, but it's all within this backdrop of thinking about both teachers and children as well. So what I'm going to do next is talk a little bit about the science. And if you've read the briefing papers, it's not going to be news to you. But I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the intervention. And of course, there's a much longer story behind all of this that I'm happy to talk about with anybody who's interested. I brought our crazy big giant manual. Like I have lots of stuff to say, but I'm not allowed to say it right now. 
Okay, so we start with a little bit of the science. What is executive function? What are executive functions? Uh, a set of mental processes located in the prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain, that coordinate and integrate the broader functions of thought, memory, emotions, and behavior. So everything, kind of. So what are they actually? Well, they're described differently depending on who you're talking to, which is another complex story. But, you know, the common denominators are working memory, attention control, so focusing your attention in a sustained way for a period of time, shifting attention from one thing to the other, and then managing impulses, so inhibitory control. And these processes guide higher order thinking and purposeful goal-directed behavior that is things like planning, decision making, setting goals, multitasking, coping, emotion control, reflection, metacognition, all of those things. And all of those things are central to effective parenting, to effective teaching, and to children being successful in the settings where they learn and play. So what else do we know? We know that these core executive functions are linked to emotions. Again, I am no neuroscientist. I'm sorry, Phil. I'm sorry, Nathan. I'm sorry, all of you who do this. I am trying not to ruin it. <laughs> um, I am no neuroscientist. Okay, so EF is linked to emotions through a stress mechanism. So we have the prefrontal cortex, which is the decision or control center of the brain, which organizes planning and goal setting and inhibiting impulses. And then we have the stuff that's sort of, if you went into the middle from here, we have the amygdala and the limbic structures, which are really about uh, emotions, right? Arousal, fear, anxiety, anger, motivation, and aggression, and fast thinking. So when the gorilla is running at you down the street, <laughs> your, your limbic system takes over and you run away, right? You're not planning and thinking. You're not using your prefrontal cortex to say, well, okay, it's a gorilla. What should I do? Maybe I should step to the side. What should I do? Should I get in cab? I should run away. <laughs> but that's a kind of crazy, silly example. Um, this is true for uh, some kids when someone speaks to them harshly. The system takes over. This is true for some kids and adults when they hear a door slam. This system takes over. Uh, this is true when people ask you to do a TED-style talk. The system <laughs> takes over and you want to run away. Um, you stop being able to think. So uh, these two regions are linked closely together through this sort of stress response system. And with chronic exposure to stress and strain, this uh, limbic set of structures are taking over and undermining the control center in more settings, in more situations than is ideal. And it's not adaptive in those everyday situations, right? Okay, so the bottom line. The truth is low-income children and adults who face toxic levels of stress are at higher risk for behavioral and neurocognitive difficulties with executive function and self-regulation. The truth is that it's not actually just about that as a deficit model. It's about challenges with, with using what you know and what you've learned, what's sitting up here in the control center when faced with chronic levels of stress. And this is true for every single one of us. It's actually true every day <laughs> when I walk in the door from work. I'm tired and stressed out and my two children run at me and they are tired and stressed out but they're yelling and they're crying. And I know what I need to do, which is slow down and sit with them and reconnect for 10 minutes. But instead, I am obsessing about the dirty dishes and what do I have to make for dinner? And this like, oh, they're crying and all I wanna do is just put my bag down. And so I yell, but I know that that's not the right response. It's not what they need in the moment. And that, that this, you can all tell yourself a story like that, right? So that's what we're thinking about and working on. So we have this, this is actually what we show to our teachers, children, and families that this stress siren goes on and it, uh, it sort of makes not usable this front part of the brain, okay? That's the science. That led us to design a set of strategies that built on the work we were already doing and I'm gonna unpack the what, when, and where of this intervention. So what, based on this science, it's really for us about stress management, interrupting cycles of stress, that lead to problem behavior, problematic behavior in adults and downstream in children. 
It's really about going back to the beginning, providing direct supports for adults. In this project, it's about parents. In our prior work, it was about teachers and schools. So we have that. Put the, the front of the brain back in control. When? When are we doing this work? We describe these as salient developmental moments. If you know the Center on the Developing Child, you've seen this picture before. Uh, and you have learned that children are not born with these skills. There are these important moments where they are developed. Everybody learns them. And there are two really important moments, although it happens really truly across this entire span. One moment is in early childhood, sort of at the point of entry into schooling. And another moment is in the transition to adulthood, to parenting, to the workplace. And so these are opportunities to make a big difference by working on these skills specifically. So we've thought about those two salient developmental moments. And where? For our work, we're really thinking about home and parenting because this builds on our other work, thinking about teachers and children directly. And our focus is on the common challenges of parenting. So um, those moments that we all struggle with as parents of young children that are perhaps more consequential um, and more challenging under conditions of extreme stress. And so we have built this two-generation approach that's aligned with our school work. But this is what, how we think about alignment. So we began by developing uh, an intervention focused on social and emotional skills that is really targeted to building children's skills from early childhood through elementary school. And we thought, wow, uh, we have been talking a lot with teachers, and they are interested and uh, in some sense, need some of these supports themselves. So we built a professional development system, it's up here, that lines up conceptually and in ac specific activities with what teachers are doing with children. And then finally, in the last year, we began to think about how do you line uh, up a focus on parenting and parents with these two other systems. So uh, one of the, just going back to what we heard earlier. One thing I think that's really interesting about this, and Phil's comment about modularity, I think it was, brought this up for me. What's really interesting about this is not the fact that the, uh, the scope and sequence is lined up. It's that across all of these groups, there are common activities, right? So there are things that you can do across these different groups that you could pull out and do in all sorts of places. And we think about these things as sort of strategies or kernels of practice that themselves are scalable in a different way than a whole scope and sequences. So for example, in our child activities, we have something called a feelings thermometer. So this feelings thermometer lives in the classroom. Some people have heard of a feelings thermometer before. It's not that uncommon. But it's a way for, it's a scaffold for children to think about their feelings and make a judgment about where they are, feeling really intense or feeling really low energy. We have a similar routine for teachers and parents, a stress thermometer. It's a different kind of idea for them, but at the core, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a way to calibrate and understand and reflect and notice where you are in this thing. So this activity goes across these. There are games that go across all of these things. So it's these little parts that I think are the scale. Slightly different way of thinking about scale, but they are scalable. Okay, enough about that. So we built something, it's called Secure Families. Secure stands for, along these principles, we built something that's called Secure Families. Secure stands for social, emotional, and cognitive understanding and regulation in education. So we have a little e there, but the e is little because it's really about all of those things in all sorts of contexts. And the idea behind it is to interrupt this stress cycle and put EF back in control, to move from stressed self to the best self. So to move from what I am when I walk in the door, which is emotions driven, <laughs> reactive, negative, and sometimes punitive, uh, to all these other things. So how are we doing that? We have built a series of workshops that follow a set of themes and that are organized in a very deliberate fashion. So they're organized in a cycle. There's a learn, plan, try, notice, and reflect components of each cycle. So what happens in the workshop happens in the same way every single month. Uh, you learn brain basics, EF development, basics about child development, about the stress response system, and learn and practice a new strategy, something just to try. You don't have to do it all the time, but it just gives you something to do when you leave 
something to reflect on and come back and talk about. Make a plan or set a goal for using the strategy. Try it out. So in the intervening month, try it out. Think about what happened. So it's not always necessarily just the doing of the strategy. It's the trying it out and saying, what did I notice when I did this? What happened when I tried this? And what do I think about that? Come back and talk with your cohort group about it. How did it go? What happened? Did it work? Did it not work? Well, how did you do it differently? And then it goes on. So we have these cycles of skill building and content, and we see the structures, the structure, how the workshops work, are really about building these transferable EF skills for adults, planning, goal setting, and reflection, and that the content, so this, the activities themselves, give you supports to build skills, like skills in self-control, stress management, emotion skills, and positive communication. And these are key self-regulation skills for both adults and children. And this structure and content is the same in the workshops we do with teachers and all school adults. And the content and the mechanisms for delivery are very similar in the work we, we do directly with children in the classroom. So to end, we kind of drew out what are the what are the mechanisms? What are the parts that we really think account for what we hope <laughs> is the huge impact of this intervention, which we have not tested yet. We've just built it over the last year. So what are the meta-concepts that we hope we're building in adults that are then transferable to all these other settings? So to the workplace, to the grocery store, to wherever. There are these. Noticing, reflecting, planning, and trying and then doing it again and practicing this all the time. Our conversations with teachers and parents have been really interesting on the notice and reflecting point. Ref noticing things is hard. It takes a lot of practice. We don't do it very well, and if you don't do it a lot, you really don't do it well, and it becomes very hard to reflect. So just building those basic skills, those habits, whether or not you're doing it about self-control or something else. It's those habits that we think are the key and the magic. Secure families' activities are an opportunity to do these things. So I'd like to thank all my partners, the Children's Aid Society, the Aspen Ascend Institute, and the New York Foundling, which is also a partner of ours. Thank you. That's it.